with that, Thomas and Kate are going to give their presentation. Uh, I haven't talked to them about their background so much, but uh, I know they've sailed back and forth to Antarctica and South Georgia Island for 20 years. And uh, anyway, they're going to give their presentation on that. Thanks, everybody, for coming. This is a good turnout. Thank you. And I got to work the computer in the back there. Are you sure? I'll go back there and then I can't. Pay no attention. <laughs> <laughs> pay no attention to the woman behind Kate the curtain. Kate the, the wizard of Oz. <laughs> 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 Kate 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 but um, if we just go to the next slide, please. So <coughs> for 25 years ago, in 87, I helped build this boat um, called Pelagic, which uh, was one of the first boats to go down to Antarctica. Can you just let this go? Oh. <coughs> and um, I worked on that for that building and it ended up being a skipper. And Kate came down as a, as a client Joined us, and we met, and uh, I, I invited her back as crew. We got married. <laughs> Helen appeared, and then we decided enough was enough, and we decided to build our own our own boat, called Pelagic. So uh, this is Seal uh, being built. Um, she's built specifically to high latitude uh, work. Very strong uh, built with a lifting keel and a lifting rudder. Next one, and also lots of insulation inside. This is the um, Keep our foam going into um, all this above the water, completely insulated. Next, and then once the boat was um, the hull was made professionally, we decided to fit the boat out ourselves. We couldn't afford it anyway, so we had to haul the boat out into Kate's parents' garden, as one does. <laughs> and so <coughs> I built this scoop, uh, not the ship, which we dragged down. Uh, the curtain rooms on the way into the into the bay in New Hampshire where Kate uh, comes from. Next one. And then the, <coughs> so the scoop now is underneath here. Um, the boat has been settled on the high water, brought down at low water, attached to the scoop. Um, next one. <laughs> With some help from the girls, you can see it was all quite a while ago, so they, they've grown up a bit. Uh, next. And then we dragged it with a um, a record truck uh, through the trees up into the garden. And uh, next one, I built a shed <coughs> for the winter and then we spent a year basically doing sit out. Um, next one, when we came to put the boat back in the water, we had a bit of a problem. There's the boat, and this is a, a, an island about a, thir a third of a mile offshore. It was the only way we could um, get enough uh, purchase to. Fortunately, it belongs to a friend who uses oak trees. <coughs> and um, next one, um, hauled it back uh, using the blocking tackle back into the water. Very quick glide of the bow through the trees. Next one. And that uh, gives you an idea of uh, the sort of hull shape and the lifting keel idea. Um, <coughs> and the lifting rudder. It's a big safety feature in high latitude life, or any life, but particularly high latitude, it means you can. If you run aground, it gives you a, a second bite at the cherry. You can pull the flaps up and uh, hope you escape. <coughs> Next one. <coughs> and the rudder um, also uh, pivots up. You can pivot down here. Um, so if you hit a, a rock and the pins are out, the keel will lift up. And then if you hit the rudder, that will lift up as well. Um, and that's been tested. You know, it's six to seven knots, so it's very effective. Safety <laughs> 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 feature. <laughs> I brought the rudder lift up and the down position and pivot things here. So at sea, offshore, you pin everything down. You're trying to fix keel, fix rudder. But if you're going to go around the rocks, you pin them up. Your chance of um, going aground, particularly in the uncharted parts of Antarctica uh, and up here as well in the uncharted areas, is, is tiny. Next. So the, <coughs> the first uh, trip we did from New Hampshire was heading to the Antarctic to Greenland. This is our idea of uh, 
a bogus type inside. And also the advantage of um, having uh, young children on board, they immediately make friends wherever you go. And these uh, two um, English children didn't speak a word of English when they came on board and made friends. And they sat, sat for days watching the girls play and <coughs> fiddling away and, and texting on their mobile phones. And it was very funny. I mean, they were, they were grandchildren of hunter gatherers, and you know, you'd offer them um, sea urchins, and they'd turn up their nose and And uh, it's been doing well in the kitchen, and we, uh, we met on Helen's birthday, so we went to a series of prawns, uh, and they're for being then cured. Um, so that just to demonstrate the sort of um, <coughs> anchoring techniques, we often get the anchor, which is in uh, majesty of water, and get that dangling, hang it, reverse in, put a hook on, and then get the sea lion spawn in that hole to anchor in position of facing the wind or the anchoring of the situation. And then you can work with clawing and bait and that sort of thing. Okay. And uh, the first official boat sailing across, we left Greenland and across to Europe, went to Scotland, and uh, from there in, uh, headed south towards uh, Antarctica, South America, Antarctica. Okay. And Selim uh, from Maori and Cat for the day. of this talk now is going to be about um, the Antarctic Peninsula here and South George Island which is here. Um, so it's about 500 miles or across the Great Passage. Uh, <coughs> we tend to start off our journey in southern Argentina at Ushuaia, which is like an intervening <coughs> channel. And then from uh, the Falkland Islands we move from Port Stanley and go to South Georgia which is about uh, 750 miles. This is actually a much more difficult journey. It's the coming back that's the problem, because this, you know, the west wind is uh, predominant. And actually, going to Antarctica is not such a big deal. Um, and, you know, going past Cape Horn, which is here, but uh, it tends to be more the wind from the south. Okay. So this is the port of Ushuaia, um, and it's rather similar to Cordova. I mean, it's a, a port with. Um, mountains and skiing and, and events of wildlife. It's a very dirty place, sadly. Um, next one. What's the latitude? Uh, it's about 50 degrees. Is that right, Jeff? More than that, yeah. 57? Yeah, it's more like it's more than that. Actually, yes. More than that. 57? Yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, they say it's like Cordova. It's not like Cordova. <coughs> this is the dock. <laughs> It's a particularly bad uh, <coughs> construction, and these often go underwater, <laughs> and there's, there's fantastic uh, explosions of, of electricity, you know, it's a classic Argentine technology. So it's a wonderful place, and we, we love it, and um, yeah, it's challenging, say the least, right? And this is um, now crossing the Great Passage, which actually Cape Horn has in the background, um, which is now on seal. Um, next picture. And in the Great Passage, as you get towards Antarctica, you start encountering the um, remains of the tabular icebergs that have broken off the Antarctic continent. Um, this is this side of the iceberg. Actually, it's not the problem. It's the little bits that goes off them that you don't see, that are grounded in the bottom bits, the smaller bits that are frozen out. Right? And now we're in Antarctica itself, and you can start to see it gets the navigation again. It's a bit more challenging. storm in Lake Orne, um, which is beginning to just down the sea, Luck. Next. So this is a very beautiful place uh, to be um, cruising, with you know, have a little rowing for a little boat, all set up. Um, the photography is actually marvelous here, the, you know, the high latitudes get these long uh, sunrises and sunsets, um, and with the raised ceiling here, you can sit, here, sit up and admire the views that, you know, after the sun's gone down, or it's going down, okay. 
often ask us if we carry a water maker, um, we don't actually, we, um, we carry a lot of water on board, but we collect water um, on our tide. Now some years, we, because they're there in the summer, we're able to find more runoff and run a hose into the tank to keep it um, fresh. No melt in it, but you can bloat it so it doesn't spoil the tank. Okay. And um, some of the places we tie up in Antarctica, this one is uh, an unusual one, it's an old, uh, the remains of an old whaling vessel that uh, the guys that were caught fire and it's burned, you know, and the runners are still on to the wreck now, um, you can tie up alongside it. If you want to join us in for the gig. <laughs> and another favorite way of tying up is um, using boulders, um, we've used rock props here. out in deep water with the ice or the ooze, uh, hopefully, and um, uh, nice and snug. That particular angle is directly seen off there. <laughs> that spot about two in the morning. Um, uh, sleep for a few hours, maybe. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> what we do with the crew when they <laughs> wear the hand. These are a species of penguin. They're German penguin. They, um, they are actually, uh, right now, they're, they're suffering quite a lot from climate change. They're losing the fur of the thighs as the weather warms up on the glacier. The Antarctic Peninsula has seen more um, uh, global warming, I think, than anywhere else on the peninsula. The climate change has been nasty on this several years. So the, the penguin populations are being displaced by another penguin population, the German ooze. well-chosen rock because happy to see us and our neighbors and warm here and we've got a really busy mob. And they also seek out climbers of um, trying to leave the, the seat because some of the ice guys will climb up onto them and they don't necessarily come back onto land and for the ice to just uh, fall out on an iceberg. It's often taken to be a refuge from the um, These are, these are the James Lee penguins, and this is a, a fellow with a plume track, which you know. Um, not so common on, um, in places where we're cruising in the North Hemisphere, but it's used as James Lee for, you know, especially in, in the winter where we're cruising. The um, emperor penguin, you've probably heard about that, way, way far south, and we never see them unless they're in that place. Somewhere. But this time of year, they're off, offshore. Traditionally, that's been the only places they've been able to find ice free, or they freed up sooner. So the you know, those creatures in habit will go back to their same spots because they're you know they're a thousand feet from us. You can't see the sun and orbit and stuff and all that. Okay. And um, a challenging environment, obviously, to keep them because they're really, really young. Um, but uh, they're displaced from the, the back to the wind, and so they're completely. 
faith in us is just simply simply faith we were <coughs> conditioned for and just told told that you know you should pray and so forth. So there's really no baggage to it. So thank you very much. And I just couldn't uh, bring it up any more. I come to Southern County for the time for Stephen. Interesting that he just lie down and just wait. Um, it says, "Take me to this is um, a verb for more sort of human mm-hmm. beings." Mm-hmm. But in any event, he just sit around long enough for us to actually come and investigate the inner crypt for some. He actually had to be climbing all over the place, <coughs> so sitting there was nothing. It says, "It's okay if you lie down and wait. Come to you if they approach you. You're not walking by behavior or perception." a great place for the kids to sort of sit and watch the wildlife going by. Uh, this is a place called Port Rockwell. It's a very um, well-known um, visitor center in, in Manhattan. It's thousands of visitors every year. The penguins can keep you uh, unfazed uh, by it. And they've actually done studies. The penguins actually do better uh, during the season than they would during the season. So visitors will come in because I think they put the, the skewers, the, the bait on them, mm-hmm. and actually put off successfully they can settle down a bit. Um, so they've done extensive studies on this. Uh, what's interesting is this type of rounded rock, the um, leopard seals will come in and hunt their back into tens of meters of these rocks mm-hmm. and in amazing uh, minutes and they can just sort of lie there with such mm-hmm. a nostril sticking out of the water and eventually penguins will just forget about them. They'll say, oh, that's mm-hmm. right. And they <laughs> take them in and snap their gun. But it's uh, fascinating to see how this leopard seals can learn how to basically mimic this sort of rock. Mm. And they're not just sitting in the nostril rock, they are hunting your back. Mm. Um, and they just happen to be that sort of rock around you. Mm. Yeah. So it's, um, yes, this is the old British Antarctic Survey <coughs> hut from the um, Second World War. Still there if you need renovated. So uh, we often spend Christmas um, in Antarctica, it's the ideal time to be there. Very long days, and uh, short nights, but nonetheless, it's there. <laughs> the flat cap Christmas tree comes out every year. <laughs> yep. So we spend a few penguins in the tree. Yep. The Dorset yeah. leopard seals, here's a, a leopard seal that's the penguin. Um, we op- curiously, we often find that the, the penguins, because of the brown penguins and leopard seals, there are some, they all turn their back. <laughs> and sort of, they just don't want to see it. Um, mm. So it's, it's an amazing sight. They just sort of shuffle around and they all hide behind the back they don't want to see. Oh, it's a crow seal, yeah. Mm. Yep. So the, the, the leopard seals really are the most, the most beautiful um, uh, in the Stephen Seal, they were so extremely few, um, mm. beautiful way to just glide around. And um, they'll spin around and, and slide through the water. Incredible, great um, veggies that they break. So they do do this is actually because they've hung over an iceberg sticking out and that's mm. because they're taking down mm. it's not underwater it's down looking down through through an iceberg underneath mm. um, yep. and they have this sort of reptilian jaw um, quite sinister looking wonderful predators On, I think they're on crabs, they're actually on krill. They have a um, curious uh, structured jaw with um, teeth that are able to sort of turn the, the krill out of the um, shell. Um, tiny, tiny minions of them uh, will breed on the, on the sea ice. And the, um, uh, it's over an iceberg, I guess. And this is a, um, a 
web of tears. Um, you see this yoga there. singing and tears we have this valley you can talk and, and admire the view at the same time <coughs> and this is the church is singing some songs at times <laughs> yeah and uh, so we we take clients down with us um, each week um, a lovely group of us who are very keen photographers and uh, looks after the girls very well when they're in their pajamas, even better to get dressed that way. <laughs> we see a lot of humpback whales. <coughs> um, <coughs> we take we identify in photos of the fleet uh, with hump humpback, humpback whale catalogs. So some of you have seen those very it's a very good database of, of whales. Um, do check. Um, this particular day, we just sat in the middle. Gerlach Strait, which was um, three whales came and came to us. We didn't go to them. They came to us and we swam around it um, for about an hour and a half. What was interesting was quite late in the season, the beginning of the season, you could come and see the um, lap boats all the way down. They had just come down to start cleaning in September with their kid, and you could see every single boat there. Uh, this time of year, it was probably late February. Gorging on krill every day, and they're so fat <laughs> that uh, the backbone's gone, and it's almost like they're so full they don't want to eat anymore, and they're so just sort of hanging out and they come around and try to eat. It's a lovely time to be down there, but we begin in December, so they are just coming to the season and they're just trying to get get their crew on board. It's a great you know, step up the sail, great change for a new sort of seasonal kind of task. The camera suffers for a lot from the whale death. <laughs> yeah. And we see a lot of authors. Um, we have had uh, sort of three different types of authors. Um, you can see someone hanged up in the jail up. Provoked, but there's one that provoked my tears when I saw Marlon Penguin and um, Bob Pittman, I think, was down there fighting this particular group of um, of whales. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> one of my favourite whales is this Wilson Stewart Hector, um, who is uh, Wilson Stewart fluttering around like a butterfly. Where the you have a calm day. Whales around, the whale oil will settle into the water and, and produce a very mirror like surface. Um, and the stone hectors will, will feed in there and they'll keep their diet on the day there and, and settle, fluttering around in, in the classic hector behavior of walking on water. <laughs> yeah. Do you see that many species in the Atlantic off the Virginia coast where <coughs> I grew up offshore fishing? Yeah. Uh, Wilson still in Hector back there. <laughs> they, they, they migrated all the way. Well, I'm assuming they did. They yeah. breed in Antarctica. Um, I don't think we saw. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure which I'm one. I'm not sure they did. Yeah, I think it was just some of the. Oh, yeah. okay. Not sure which way. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Yeah. Um, but they, they are the most amazing being in the world. You know, you've got the scene fluttering around like butterflies. And, yeah. Yeah. and literally walking on the water. Invisible to us. Yeah. A lot of um, South Polar skuas, um, fantastic flies. Uh, it's, it's almost a huge joy to watch them. Um, they are able to, you know, they have webbed feet, but they're able to pick up a penguin egg in their beak on the wing. Um, and they are so canny with their work. There's a key covering the fly up and sort of sedating on the penguin on the edge of the pond. Break this way, and the penguin will jump that way, and the long leg will come and look for the egg. Um, it's just 
the nose in the fire. Yeah? Those of you who get steam off occasionally by the diminishing bubbles, I'll touch them on that. Of course, the aerial battles will be going on. few pictures now of some of the stuff we've been done uh, from the boat over the years, supporting mining expeditions, pioneer expeditions. This was a um, mining expedition. Yeah? It's actually an iceberg. If you have to go to the round, you can climb, <laughs> you can then climb up three times up the deck and no rope to get up. Tailing thingy on, on the seal, which is being used for uh, one of the funds that's been thrown around the iceberg. Next, uh, we decided to be going through the times of the South Pole, but uh, the, the Antarctic convergence actually includes the Antarctic Ocean and includes that point, so it takes you a bit north. And the convergence is where the Southern Ocean meets the Atlantic Ocean. Um, the colder waters of the Antarctic Ocean slide underneath the Atlantic. Um, so it just sort of a quill that there is sort of like that. And because it's slightly further north, the latitude is a bit warm, about 50, 60 degrees south, so it's um, more clement weather. Yep. Staying near the, towards the, a lot of these um, uh, Encado vessels, um, which mentors who have the sort of stay in company with you as you're sailing along, you just they seem to be sort of ship tolerant, so they're waiting for you to throw out Company you for days and days, just kept heavily watching. Yeah. Or stopped them. Because you know, you're doing several hundred miles across the ocean, and it's like that didn't happen in the company. Yeah. I think they call them Cape vessels as well. The French, I think, call them. The test crews. I think even though it's, it's the name for a test crew. Starting the journey, this is the Port Stanley from the Falkland Islands. Um, place to stock up your marmite and other important things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, up the Lena Geese, and up the Hotel. Yeah. And as you leave, um, you see a lot of these birds, and I mistakenly <coughs> heard this the first time I saw it. I thought this was a Mongolian albatross. Had a photo on the wall of two of them, and um, the captain's officer came in, said, "Oh, nice picture of a southern roar." I was slightly taken up with it. <laughs> I thought it was a Mongolian albatross. He said, "No, no, it's a southern roar." I said, "Well, how do you know?" And his his little bird book on the table. He said, "Flip that over." <laughs> he was the photographer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, everyone in the Falklands has two jobs: you know, the, the, the customs officer and the, the, the bird book. But the, the distinguishing feature is this black line on the beach. Mm. And um, wandering albatross will often have a, a, a red secretion here. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the wanderer, no black line and a red secretion here. Mm. We're not absolutely sure what that secretion is. And the older the wanderer is, the more white they look. Um, <coughs> so that's a, you know, and they've got to live to 55 years old. So I'm going to be sure when I'm long one. Sadly, it's happening more and more. And uh, they 
Everything is changing as a result of the one man debate. Any other members? So then for me, the, the seeing the news is always the highlight of, of any change, but it's always the one that kind of makes us remember. It's also the things down, all the things down there we go. Um, it's just magnificent drive. I mean, when you, you're part of Rose the Beggar Will Come, and the farm that is sat on the wall of Rose is the most destructive. Yeah, so the saving to the parish daughter is a you know, thing we, we, we know is the, the 700, 800 miles. We see a lamb here, and uh, we'll support an island lamb the next week at Turin, <laughs> and sung in the short spray. <laughs> That's about three weeks of prep. itself is, is uh, about 100 miles long, um, very rugged, um, only a little ahead of us. And it's backwards and inverted across the island, and the crossing in this case in Turin is a very, very uh, great great place for, for mountaineering and skiing. Fun to ride on. Um, gives you an idea of the sort of terrain now in those arch crossings that you don't get these um, classic grasses up here. It's a nice change. There's a huge amount of um, minions of barren petrel, red of rats, uh, and we know that, sadly, a uh, huge amount of uh, uh, barren petrels will be destroyed by the rats which uh, bring off the sinking ships and you know, the, the crazy tail, and uh, as a result, virtually wipe out uh, the, the bird population, the barren petrel population, certainly, and the fact that there is habitat for a rat is a nice little hole in the nose of the rat. Um, but uh, this year, or the last five years, there's been a humongous rat, rat eradication um, program with helicopters and boats, and they have been able to get to work into the biggest rat eradication in the world. Um, it's done by New Zealand helicopter pilots. It's an incredible risk of flying a big pattern through GPS logging. Um, we've had stunning results already in the last And the <coughs> this is um, classic in memorial stone in the Gripwickham Whaling Station here. Um, this is the heart of the, of the parish order. A lot of these graves are from whalers um, killed in, in the turn of the century. Uh, the barn, whatever. Uh, the machinery, you see the size of the machinery is just surprising at some of the mint stuff. And the anchorage called Cobbler's Cove and you can see there in trust iron because we've got a shoreline out here <coughs> and here and here <coughs> people often say well what's, what's the point of putting shorelines out in the iron work and you get these horrendous wind wars out uh, which is what we have in here and that you know lay you right down and the cave ends up like that so you want to sleep well <coughs> try to We have a bunch of elephant seals and king penguins in the bottom. You just sit down and this cave actually was described in the notes in the journal. You pretty soon this line of penguins came towards there and they're just to investigate. You know, you <coughs> just sit down there, they'll come to you. Okay. So these are the king penguins. the whalers, the Norwegian whalers, uh, came both introduced um, reindeer, and this last year, all the reindeer <coughs> in one herd were eliminated, they were um, <coughs> brought down from, um, I guess in the rat terms, you know, men were shot from all the cadavers they could find, um, yeah, and that <coughs> gives you an idea of why they, did it. they were um, destroying this in natural habitat, because this is an Glazer, and you can see that the, um, the 
process of rebounding and then that takes um, quite a while to take home until you're really quite ready to use it. Right. I've done a few tricks with scientists. Uh, this particular trick is uh, with uh, quantum entomology. Um, and the bio is a plant life is confused and it uh, just starts vacuuming up a, a sample of uh, the insect life that's been studied couple of million six years old and studied before. And so you get all these insects packed back in a wonderfully eccentric um, kind of um, scientist uh, worship. And so you give these him and his wife are eating the rotten um, little flying insects there. So then they're trying to find out what is uh, been introduced and what is Plant biologists look at things trying, um, trying to figure out which of the invasive species you might want to encounter up in um, collecting seeds for the um, pea or seed um, program, or the sort of the second seed from down the road, seed bank. And uh, it, for me, it was a, it's fascinating to see these people working. I mean, I, I suddenly realized how dedicated they were and what fanatics they were about plants because they'd walked up this hill to see wandering albatross on the nest, which to me was one of the most amazing sights in nature. And I just turned around and they were gathered around a tiny speck of moss. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a, it was totally, you know, this could only have happened. <laughs> but credit to them, they were unimpressed by the birds. <laughs> they're logging it all on these data logs. It's a demonstration of why you um, have to be careful about the, the, um, the problems with plants and seeds. It's the birds climbing down the hill next to them and having, <coughs> having to extract all the seeds from their hat. <laughs> and they're, they're fanatical about the, the entire field of green landing, which basically goes through all your clothing, all the Velcro, <coughs> all the pockets that you can use vacuum the bags and, and so it in that digging process they were just you know moving seeds around the island and uh, he was he was reached as well in the <coughs> bio part of the trip and this is a, a british antarctic survey uh, research center for bird islands um, <coughs> and our main focus is on these uh, fur seals and this is the height of the fur seals this is in december These are sort of snowy tree squirrels. Um, you know, the sort of the, the salmon here is here, go around scavenging and everything. Yes? <laughs> and um, so they, they are, they, you know, very, I hate to say the word, cute. <laughs> yes? Fascinating. I, I like this. vicious, man-chasing monsters that <laughs> this age are looking at. <laughs> and um, I was heading in her survival suit doing some uh, diving and everything. They, it's a sort of fur seal suit, I suppose you imagine, it's lined with all around you in the water. And then when you nibble at you, the age and their <coughs> breeding age, they, be, they become quite a, a fearsome predator. They actually chase you almost as fast as you can run once you get into their territory. Yeah. Nice and cool up towards the horizon. Yeah. <coughs> and the, um, the males are fighting for territory and that's why it's their main way that they're not dying is they get a cut like this and gets infected and, and now dies of infection. <coughs> and they're hiding either amongst the, amongst the tussocks 
you see how the tussle gets uh, worn away with their visors. You see it. If we saved the hunters with our tribes, well, the bands were really up and lost some of these in power. And, uh, in the mid 1800s, 1900s. And um, so we now back <coughs> with this huge force of you know, huge numbers. Um, I think largely as a result of the fact that Wales were wiped out and the Blue Band took. Now that you know, their, their population is out of balance, and the secular major problem for some of the booming Welsh is the fear of the Welsh trying to displace them. <coughs> so this is a you know, big beach master bull, and we always carry these uh, bottles with us um, because they will bring their full testosterone charge fury come after you if you get into a pair too deep. They try to edge through. <coughs> Occasionally, they will come charging at you and tickle the whiskers of the stick as they go back. Um, the density has become so great on some of these that we actually can't allow them. This is actually how they're going to get to six meters per minute. And then one of the problems with this eel is they will, um, if uh, you know, you take a dislike for a dinghy, they'll come along and put a hole in it. I think is a fur seal uh, <coughs> for their dinghy, right? So <coughs> this very quick sequence of what we do is we get a, a, a bite, and often you know, we're a long way away from the mothership. So I have quite a handy way of, of mending these. It's a, a life raft repair kit, right? It's just like that. regularly attacked dinghies, elephant ears being known as well around the world. Some of them do well, right? <laughs> now talking of elephant seals, here's the beach master of the <coughs> wonderful pair of fish. <laughs> Very long. <coughs> and there's a, a huge sexual dimorphism between males and females. Eyeing up some other chap and this chap <laughs> tickles. So they don't, they don't mess around, they have their big harem and they, they look after that, right? So they have their own pet. So the, the size percentage is just as important. So often a big beach master will have you know, 60 females. <coughs> Flipping uh, the, the beach band up onto their back for <coughs> protection against the sun, because it's sunburn. Look at those uh, hair tucks. Right. Right. <coughs> this is what they call the weenie eel, the small tuck. That's the weenie. Actually, now in the, the, the museum at Ripperton, there's a, um, a dust uh, wandering albatross gives you an idea of the size. Pretty really big, wing size. Right? And <coughs> so it's a wandering albatross fish on a net. In the background, you see the Young adults are basically sorting out their sort of fingers club they're trying to put a new club to their <laughs> partner who will be their partner for life. Um, so there's a lot of posturing, a lot of um, frills, um, gargling, especially out in the club, which you know, I wish that had the sound of it. It's quite an amazing sound when you're vibrating your uh, frills together in a, in a sort of a shuffle. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a wonderful time of offering away plain pasture lady. Cell phone transport issues from um, Mike Mansell City. He's also one of my favorite ones. Very beautiful bird, and they um, took had this lovely flight to show to you guys a picture of them. They did this absolutely lockstep and like two missiles were flying around in absolute perfect unison. So, and you'll see them, especially around the cliff, soaring. noise is transported in the hills. Take you down here. And you'll see a grey headed albatross as well, as you mentioned in Lake Kalibu. Um, from Bird Island, yeah. And a black eyed albatross. Also um, a very friendly but friendly <coughs> young man. You'll see there's a great red billed tip tail over there. Their, their population is also becoming quite high. Do they build those mounds for the green eggs? Um, some of them are black eyes. Yeah, yeah so yeah. black black eyes do have those mounds. Yeah. Yeah. And you'll see the famous picture on the Falkland Islands of the Brazilian colony. Each one is its own little mound. Um, so here's a Cape petrel again. You see flying in. Southern giant petrel, these um, <coughs> same predatory type seabirds. Um, and okay. So here's one of these Achille passages, and it's a series of male Achille that typically are dying in their wombs, and they'll come along and sit on the, on the other day. crucial part of the environment. Yeah. And there's some white morph also flying by on the island. Yeah. And then <coughs> the uh, imperial cormorant, also very uh, beautiful bird, they nest and they fly in the air. Uh, this is actually a wreck of an old sailing vessel with the, the dead eye from the sailing ship. Transported pintail, which is a fruit the only world's only carnivorous duck. Yeah. They were most uh, known to predate on the Achille pastures as well. So and they also live on maybe the green stuff, but they're, they're part of the great Achille as well. Um, you see a lot of the Antarctic terns, um, distinguishable by the, the red bezons on the beak. Distinguished breeding plumage that they have with the Arctic terns are also there, but they're, they're not in their breeding plumage. Um, so the Ar Arctic tern <coughs> comes all the way back up here. Uh, it's a long migration of any bird in the world. Um, so it's a strange thing to see it down there and then you come back up here. So you'd think maybe you're seeing the same bird. Macaroni penguin. Uh, this colony here is called Big Mac. And it's <coughs> it's uh, found in the honey penguin jar. And this is do you remember Kate? Half a million or something? Uh, Kate, slightly. Yeah, I remember Kate, yeah, penguin. Um, yeah. But the noise is just astonishing. Um, and you can find it in the uh, yeah. Yeah. It's quite an angry. Rebellious is sort of the, the laid back type, but inside is a. Something about the hairstyles, maybe, a bit of. <laughs> <laughs> they're always really ratty. You know, you go near them, they're always 
Benjamin Bourne. Because we don't have a regular match to produce our role as a technical player. Invariably, they always choose a type that we could see, a type that Danny and Peter Surf worked for. <coughs> and they have incredible acrobats when it comes to um, jumping in and off rocks, um, throwing their feet with uh, surfing and then you know, slamming rocks and then and they're able to make it appear as well. Um, and directly to, to runway, you can just see them coming in and surfing on the So uh, South Georgia has a huge amount of these old uh, whaling stations uh, off of Prince Olaf Harbour, which are all out of bounds now. Um, one of the trips we did <coughs> to uh, South Georgia was with a group of uh, Norwegian uh, industrial archaeologists uh, studying the um, next slide, studying the, the remains of the whaling stations. Um, and there's a lot of asbestos hidden in amongst the hijack and what have you, so they make my image look completely out of bounds. And they were mapping with lasers and stuff to kind of GPS the whole thing. I've seen a film that of this and of the working um, whaling station back in the 1910s and it was pretty rough, but here is this thousands of ships in here. Terrible. Heavy shipwreck. And each one of these Full of whale oil and it's just crazy. Yeah. And actually, that whaling station had its own football club <laughs> as well. So it's a, a little footy practical. A few, few seals associated with it. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, they brought, they came down there for the season, they brought pack sugar and their own forges, their lathes, they could, they could basically guide off the boat. Totally self-sufficient, and I, you know, we just we just beat the pull of propellers as well as the propeller just got down quite a bit of our ice and stuff. So we just had to sell off and sell the reef and throw a new one on. Yeah. And even before the whalers, the these tripods we used to um, um, uh, rendering down uh, seal skeletons here to do this uh, rendering. <coughs> Mid 1800s, and that's where they got their start. And it's a sort of April, May now, then towards the end of the, the work of the season, then it starts to get a little bit rough. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> you'll see a lot of the whale blood there on the beach. Yeah. It's a sad sight to walk around. It's King penguins are, are sort of uh, one of the highlights of South Georgia, this uh, two really big colonies here. Um, they're an interesting life cycle. They have one group of according to the um, one 18 month cycle and another one being another 18 month cycle. So they're it's a it's a very good strategy for survival because they're sort of a big you know mortality event for one group, keeps them with the other one and survive it. So you've got adults with eggs, adults molting, adults um, weaning the chicks, and then it's a very interesting colony to visit because you get the whole, a snapshot of the entire life cycle of the king penguin. Yeah. And uh, for me, uh, yeah, the one, the one side of the Indian penguin is quite a beautiful, and they're, they're only slightly shorter than sometimes. Surprising how far up the hill they go. Yeah. And the um, usual um, egg pouch there, they just get the eggs in this sort of a plastic bag full of pouch here. Yeah. And heading out to their morning swim. idea 
Sorry guys, we're just losing imaginary and possible leads there. <laughs> Fantastic timing. This particular column we're trying to show the two months time in the past. The way we're sort of looking for is we're sort of open open laws in the the chart that we Uh, cushion um, to sell. Yeah. It always astonishes me how um, our parent and client set in the last whatever thousand last ten years. And so I think it's done by the work that's done by Sam and his wonderful um, <coughs> core. Unusual one, um, the only one we saw as we came down was this black moor. Very, very snazzy. <laughs> I thought when we first saw it, it was uh, um, oil contamination, but these muddy pools <coughs> and they nice sort of see their toes. Thank you. 